Lynn? Okay. <laughs> well, okay. Good to see everyone here tonight. And the first thing I'd like to say is that I love you. I love you all. You know I'm setting you up, right? <laughs> We kind of like you too. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when Owen used to say that. I just want you to know I love you before I preach this sermon. <laughs> no. Uh, but uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. This is kind of picking up where we were last week. Where, you know, we were, we were in Luke, you know, and it says you'll be betrayed by everyone, right? Brothers and sisters and friends. You'll be hated by everybody for my name's sake, right? And, but you'll win the true life of your souls, right? And that's what we want. That's, that's, what, that's what Jesus called us to, to win the true life of our souls. And, but in, in verse... Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, he says, Now about food offered to idols, of course we know that all possess, all of us possess knowledge, yet mere knowledge causes people to be puffed up, you know, to bear themselves loftily and be proud, but love edifies and builds up and encourages one to grow. And, you know, that's what this we're all about is that we, we want to grow. I mean, why do all this if we're not going to grow, right? I mean, that's what he's called us to do, is to grow, to win the true life of our souls, right? If anyone imagined that he has come to know and understand much of divine things without love, he does not perceive and recognize and understand as strongly and clearly nor has he become intimately acquainted with anything as he ought or is necessary. So, yes, we know this, that the love is the goal, right? To, to have that kind of agape love that God has for us and that we should have for others and one another. But, um, you know, in, in winning the true life of your soul, See, Jesus had the true life of his soul, right? That Jesus walked in that. He, Jesus never sinned. Jesus was totally fulfilled, you know. Where does it say that uh, in Hebrews it comes to mind? Uh, let's see, I'll find it. Yeah, I think this is it. Oh, that's not it. What's the scripture? What does it say in Hebrews where uh, he was? He said he was ranked above his peers, or uh, he the joy of exult the, of exultant joy. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah. I thought that was well, Hebrews. It's actually from Psalm 45. It's actually chapter 1. Is it? Hebrews chapter 1 is somewhere in there. First, oh, in there. Two, yeah, yeah, it is. Verse 9. We'll start at verse 8. He says, um, Hebrews 1, but as to the Son, he says to him, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of absolute righteousness. You have loved righteousness and you have hated lawlessness. Therefore God, even your God, has anointed you with the oil of exultant joy and gladness above and uh, beyond your companions. You know, Jesus had that. I mean, he was totally fulfilled. He was full of joy, although he was a man of sorrows, right? And he had that oil of exultant joy and gladness. And see, God wants that for all of us. But 
Uh, and, and that's what, that's in, in creating in us his nature and putting his nature in us, we will learn to truly uh, enjoy life, right? To the fullest, right? But, you know, when, when, you're, when you're born into this world as a fallen uh, creature, uh, we don't understand those things yet, right? But we're getting there. And so, you know, it's, it's very important uh, for us to always remember that, you know, love edifies and encourages others to grow. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. And that's what we want to do. You know, when, when Jesus, you know, and, and the love, you know, we have this illusion that love is always tolerant and ooey-gooey and everything, but see, that wasn't really true. When Jesus would, would, um, would confront the Pharisees and Sadducees for, for the evil that they were, he was loving them. He was trying to snap them out of their, their, um, their ignorance and their bondage. You know, when he called them a brood of vipers, you know, that wasn't exactly the Dale Garnet Carnegie school of how to win friends and influence people. But actually, it was better than that. Uh, some of them did repent, I'm sure. But, um, and, you know, and when he met the, the young rich ruler, you know, it, it's, well, he was going to tell him his fault, right? And it, and it said, and Jesus loved him. Well, he loved the man enough to tell him, hey, you're going the wrong way. You got this wrong, and I'm, I want to help you, right? But the young man went away grieved because he had a lot of riches, and Jesus told him to give it, give it to the poor and come and follow him, right? Then he would have really been rich, rich in what true riches are. And we talked about that last week. But, see, what we're dealing with here, this is that the, where the body of Christ is today, you know, the, the, you know, we have this illusion in the church that in the end times, you know, the body of Christ is going to be amazing, dynamic. No. In the end times, the body of Christ is going to be falling away like it is now. We're in the midst of the great apostasy. You know, why would Jesus tell you the, uh, the parable about the, the uh, unjust judge in Luke 18? And at the end of it, he says... And when I return, will I find faith in the earth? Right? Because he knows that uh, Satan ain't playing games and he knows how people's flesh is. And that, that few would be that find uh, real life. Right? Few that would be find the life of their souls. So in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, he says, and let us consider and give attentive, uh, continuous care to watching over one another. Uh, Hebrews 10, 24. Let us give continue, uh, consider and give cont attentive, continuous care to watching over one another. Stirring how, uh, studying how we may stir up or stimulate to love and helpful deeds and noble activities. This is uh, our, uh, our assignment in the body of Christ in these last days, is we have to study how we can stir up people, you know, to uh, fan the embers of their uh, life in the Lord because so many people in the body of Christ, their, their faith life is smoldering. And, um, you know, there's so many, especially in America, there are so many options. Mm -hmm. There's so many options. You know, in centuries past, people didn't have a lot of options. You know, it was uh, work and gather food and try to stay warm and uh, raise your kids and stay alive. That was their options in life. Now there's a gazillion options. I mean, with the internet, with you know, satellite television, with all the entertainment. And you know, this was all prophesied about the end times that 
that there would be vain amusements, yeah. right, that would come. The world, especially America, is full of vain amusements. I mean, people are just eaten up with it. Vain amusements. I mean, you name it. Look, yeah, I go through my YouTube page, because we have a YouTube channel, and, I mean, anything imaginable people will find amusement in, you know? Rolling around in the mud or whatever with, you know, trucks or whatever. But these are vain amusements instead of uh, lovers of God, right? So God is encouraging us in the body of Christ. He's, he's showing us, hey, we need to... We need to, and this is, a, this is not an easy task. Uh, this takes real wisdom. It takes some prayer. Because we, a lot of times, we don't know what to do. We, we, have, we know these people. We have these people we know and love. And you can't get their attention. You can't, you know, it's like, it's got to be a God thing. You know, but the easy thing to do is get frustrated with them. <laughs> You know, that's the easy thing to do. And God's got, no, I'm not calling you to do the easy thing. <laughs> you know, that's the easy thing to do. I mean, it just happens, right? You're just frustrated. It's like, why? <laughs> but prop, God probably go, goes, yeah, why you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why do you do what you do, right? Yeah. So, you know, keep an attentive eye on yourself, as we were saying last week. But, yeah, he's very patient, Right, and, and that's the way he wants us to be. And like I say, it's, it's easy to get frustrated. It's easy to be impatient. But God would, would like to stir up in us and go, hey, pray about it. Pray for these people and figure out, you know, let, let me show you. Because God, well, he will show us. And, and if it isn't us, he'll send somebody else to show them, right? He says, and he goes on to stay, you know. To, to give a ten, continuous care, watching over one another, not forsaking or neglecting to assemble together, as is the habit of some people. You know that's you know how that can get. You know, you know you you miss one or two or three times, and then and then it becomes a habit, and then your flesh likes the habit, and you don't want to break the habit, and 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 see here's the deal. Just coming to church, you know, that doesn't make you righteous, no, no. right? That's not what we're saying. But, you know, it, what's, what's in your heart is, is you know, if, if you're desiring to know God and to be changed, then you would want to. And if you get into habit, well, I don't want to. Well, if you ain't there, you're going to be somewhere, right? Right? You know, well, I can, I, can praise, I can praise the Lord out when I'm on the lake doing my bass fishing. Yeah, but do you? <laughs> Probably not. And even if you are, God, that's not God, what God's saying here. He's not saying, not forsaking to go bass fishing and, and, and praise me out on the lake. <laughs> right? He, he, he's saying, assemble together. Well, how come? How come God wants us to assemble together? Yeah, you know, that's where all the friction happens, oh, really? right? <laughs> well, that's that's right. That's where the friction happens. That's how we kind of sandpaper and polish each other off, right? That's that's what happens. But see, that's the way God is. He's like, hey, let's get this thing going. Let's get it on. Come on. It, it may look ugly. It may not be pretty in the body of Christ. It's not a pretty place. You know, if you're just going there with a nice Sunday dress and a nice uh, pretty floppy hat, you know, that's not reality. You know, reality is that when, 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 you, when all this friction happens among the body of Christ, you know, these things have to be dealt with. And, and God doesn't delay about it. He's like, no, let's just get it on. Let's just get this thing done. You know, I always like to refer back to uh, where the, uh, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel started. 
It started with a guy named Jacob who had two wives that were always feuding and, and two housemaids that were always feuding among the wives and they had 12 children out of these four women. And I'm like, and God's going, it wasn't a problem for me. Well, that's the way with the body of Christ. You know, we got all this mess going on in the body of Christ and God's going, it's not a problem for me. You know, I, this is how I can, I can work through that. It is amazing. It's amazing. See, we're of the illusion, well, we have to be like this or we have to be like that. It's got to be all pretty. No, it isn't pretty all the time. Actually, it's pretty ugly a whole lot of the time. Yeah. It really is. Okay? And it, it, it just doesn't get pretty until it gets ugly. Then it'll get pretty. You know? It'll feel good when it quits hurting. <laughs> right? Yeah. Not forsaking or neglecting to assemble together, as is the habit of some, some people, but admonishing, warning, urging, encouraging one another, and all the more faithfully as you see the day approaching, right? All the more faithfully, right? Why would he say that warning, urging, encouraging? Because he's warning again, hey, there's dangers. Well, what's the danger? You've fallen away. That's the danger. The danger is you falling away or getting into some presumption and get yourself in a big mess and make shipwreck of your faith, right? And, and, and he's saying in that verse before, you know, hey, continually watch over those in your care, right? Because he knows the wiles of the devil. That's why he's telling us these things, right? Because we're in a war. We're flat out in a war. Amen. We are. We're in a war. It, it, it really, if we really knew what was at stake, you know, we'd, we'd probably all take it very much more seriously. The, the stakes are so high. You know, how he, he says over there in Hebrews, he, he says, you know, uh, you, you see much, but you don't really understand the true meaning, right? Well, we really need to understand the true meaning. And, you know, that's why we meet together. You know, and we meet to hear the anointed word. And then when we do our part, the measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you. Right? It's a process. Right? So go to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews 6, verse 3. If indeed God permits, we will now proceed to advanced teaching. Okay. We'll go ahead and proceed now. <laughs> For it is impossible to restore and bring again to repentance those who have been once for all enlightened, who have consciously tasted the heavenly gift and become sharers of the Holy Spirit, and have felt how good the Word of God is. Can you all relate with this? Yes. Right. See, over there, he's warning us. Right? Because he, he's saying, hey, it's, 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 all, it's impossible to restore. Ooh, you know? And the mighty powers of the age and the world to come, if they then deviate from the faith and turn away from their allegiance to bring them back to repentance, it's impossible for, because while as long as they nail upon the cross the Son of God afresh and are holding up to contempt and shame and public disgrace for the soil which has drunk the rain and repeatedly falls upon it and produces vegetation useful to those uh, for whose benefit it is cultivated partakes of a blessing from God. But if the same 
soil persistently bears thorns and thistles, it's considered worthless and near to being accursed whose end is to be burned. Now, look. You don't hear this in the body of Christ. Nobody wants to talk about these things. It sounds negative. It sounds, it sounds uh, scary, right? It sounds ominous. Oh, no, you know? Well, you know what? That's the way it's supposed to be taken. That's the way we're... we're, we're it's a warning to us. It's supposed to be taken as a warning. The... the Having a reverential fear of God is a good thing, right? We should not presume upon His, uh, his goodness and His kindness, right? Just saying. I mean, that's what I'm seeing here. And, you know, persistently bears thorns and thistles. I mean, this was, this was the whole deal with uh, uh, the, the, the parable of the seeds, you know, those who have thrown them, sown among the thorns, they don't bear fruit, right? And, and the word gets choked out of their life, right? And that's why we do this. That's why we meet together. That's why we try to keep our lives in the word all the time, right? Much as possible. Even though we speak this way, yet in your case, beloved, we are now firmly convinced of better things that are near to salvation and company it. For God is not unrighteous to forget or overlook your labor and the love which you have shown for his namesake in ministering to the needs of the saints, as you still do. But we do strongly and earnestly desire for each of you to show the same diligence and sincerity all the way through in realizing and enjoying uh, the full assurance and development of your hope until the end. You know, he didn't even say faith. He said of your hope until the end. Well, you know what? It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's why we do this, right? You know, David prayed at the beginning of the service. You know, we pray, our desire is, we want to be one of the 144,000, right? Well, we understand that you know, to be that, it takes a real commitment. That stuff isn't just given out. You know, God's no respecter of persons. You know, he even says in Galatians, he says, you know, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. You know, people in the body of Christ, they... they they're always looking at somebody else, you know. Uh, they're getting blessed and they're not getting blessed, you know. And, and so there's this envy and this competition and jealousy and all these kind of things in the body of Christ. Well, I'm going to get into it tonight about envy. The, see, even Pilate knew it was because of envy that they crucified Jesus. The Pharisees envied him. Well, why? Why did they envy Jesus? Because Jesus had the oil, the oil of exultant joy, right? Jesus was raising people from the dead. He was healing the sick. He was, you know, feeding the multitudes. He, was, he had the true life of his soul. And they didn't have that, you know. And he told them, hey, you're full of envy and jealousy and malice and ill will. He told them what they were full of. Right? That's the flesh. Right? All right. In order that you may not grow disinterested and become sluggards, but imitators. Imitators behaving as those who through faith and by practice of patient endurance and waiting are inheriting the promises. Well, praise the Lord. You know, that's a good thing. You know, learning to be patient uh, is a good thing. You know, you always hear, oh, don't pray for patience. Well, you don't have to pray for patience. You know, you don't have to do that. <laughs> you know, it's, one, it's a fruit of the Spirit. 
right? And if you walk with Jesus, if you walk in the, in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, you know, you will develop these things. Um, you know, that's the problem in the body of Christ is people are trying to get things in the natural. You, in the, they're trying to gain spiritual things naturally. And you can't do that. It does not work. The mind of the flesh and the mind of the spirit, they're antagonistic to each other. Um, look at uh, Mark 4. Try to stick with my notes tonight. That's a novel concept, isn't it? Sometimes I bounce all around. I said, I should have stuck with my notes. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. But anyway, this is supposed to be an encouraging message. But it is warning, and, and that's a good thing. Yes, I mean, this is, is what this is why we meet together because uh, you know, uh, you know what what we're up against in what we have to overcome in life is the world, the flesh, and the devil. Well, that's huge. You know, that's a big thing. But greater is he that's in us than he's in the world if we appropriate it, right? But if we're falling away, if we're get, you know, going back into old idols that we once had, you know, living that nostalgic life of how America used to be, I remember a lot of problems back then too, you know? We just look at it now. Oh, it was so great back then. Really, was it? <laughs> Mark 4, 22. Things are hidden temporarily only as a means to revelation. For there's nothing hidden except to be revealed. Nor is anything kept secret except in order that it may be made known. If any man has ears to hear... Let him be listening. Let him perceive and comprehend. And he said to him, to them, be careful what you're hearing. Right? The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you. Right? Power. Power and revelation knowledge. You know, like I said, it, you know, it's the measure thought to study that we give to the truth you hear. You, you can't fake this. You know, it's you and God. I mean, really, if you want to grow spiritually, if you want your life to, you know, make advances, your spiritual life, this is what you got to do. You know, there's no shortcut. You know, some people see other people advancing and they get envious of that. But when these other people, hey, they're just reaping what they're sowing, right? I mean, if they're reaping into thought and study and, 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 and the truth they hear, then they're going to, uh, they're, if they sow into that, they're going to reap that. They will reap virtue and knowledge. Now, other people in the body, well, why do they get that? No, I don't get that. Because you're sowing something else. Or you're not sowing that. It's that simple, really. Right? And then we get the fighting and the warring. Right? I'm just saying. For to him who has will more be given, but from him who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. See, the devil, he's no holds barred. Even if you don't get anything, he'll take that from you. He, the, the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. It's all he knows how to do. And that's all he's going to do. It's his nature, and, that's, and we're in his territory, and that's what he's going to do. You, you're target number one for him. Right? And that is the reality of life in the church on planet Earth. That's just the reality. You know, why should we sugarcoat all this stuff? We shouldn't. When we sugarcoat it and tell people about God's greasy grace and, 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 and his sloppy agape and, and about 
prosperity and all this stuff. That's a bunch of baloney. It's a bunch of distraction. It's not real. What's real is Satan wants to wipe us out. And he and he and God has called his body to be to have oneness in the faith, to be in holy array. Right? Well, how are we going to do that when we're telling these fairy tales to the body of Christ and giving the, them these delusions? It ain't going to happen. You know, we have to say the hard things. I don't do all the hard things. I'm not all polished up and all perfect, but it still has to be said. Somebody has to say it. You have to say it. If, if you have to wait for some pastor to get perfect before he can say anything, it's never going to get said. You know? No, they're, they're getting all polished and cleaned and they have all their stuff just like everybody else. Right? I'm just saying. Look at Hebrews 12. You know, there's just too many people that we've known in the body of Christ that have grown disinterested. Right? And it, it, this, this was all prophesied for the last days. Hey, it, it, this is going to happen this way. I'm warning you. Y'all need to stick together and finish this thing out. Because everything's going to get be against you to grow disinterested. It's, it's all going to be there coming against you. And he's not going to stop. Right. Satan's not going to stop. He's insane. He's a maniac. And he will not stop. And we might as well just tell it like it is. Right? We, we need to know what we're up against. But God is greater. we got to stay in the greater. Right? Hebrews... Chapter 12, verse 15. 15. Exercise foresight and be on the watch to look after one another, to see that no one falls back from and fails to secure God's grace in order that no root of resentment and rancor and bitterness or hatred shoots forth and causes many... Uh, uh, it causes trouble and bitter torment and many become contaminated and defiled by it. You know, it says there in Haggai, unholiness is infectious, right? And he's telling us in the body of Christ, hey, look after one another. Make sure they, people don't fail to secure God's grace. You know, when you confront somebody in the body of Christ, that is love. Hey, it's not an enjoyable thing to do. I mean, we don't want to go confront somebody and say, hey, brother, I mean, really? Come on, man. We don't like doing that. You know, who wants to do that? I don't want to do that. But love should impel us to do it. Really, if you have an opportunity you should not miss that opportunity. And see, we can do it in love. We can do it. It doesn't have to... Look, you just present it, and what they do with it is now on them. You know, you put the ball in their court. But if, if you do it with love that, that edifies and encourages someone to grow, then you should do it. It's the right thing to do. What they do... Hey, even if they cloud up and rain all over you, Okay, all right, well, that wasn't pleasant, but, you know, at least, at least you give them an opportunity. And you know what? I clowned up and rained all over people before, too. And then I went home and said, I don't know why I clowned up and rained all over them. Right? That was just wrong of me to do that. Right? So people have to go home and think about it. And try not to take it so personally, you know? 
And then you call them up and say, hey, man, I, I'm, I, I don't know why I did that. I'm sorry. You know, you're right and I was wrong. Right? And then, then people begin to be set free. You know, then they can pause and consider, hey, you know what? I have been a slacker lately. I have been backsliding lately. You know, and, and, and they will realize, hey, that person really loves me to, to care enough to go through the discomfort of telling me. That's the way I would think I would see it. He won brother. He won you over. Yeah, he won you over, right? Hopefully. I mean, that's the goal, right? Look at James 3. But see, in the body of Christ, there's just all kinds of nastiness, right? See, God sees it all. You know how we were saying last week you know, of this illusion that uh, God doesn't see any of that because we're all, we're all covered by the blood and God doesn't see any of our faults and failures and sins. What an illusion. That's so dumb. Really, that's just some, some, somebody came up with in the body of Christ Right, that God doesn't know. We're all naked and exposed uh, to Him with whom we have to do. Right? That's what it says. We're all naked and exposed. Right? Everybody's trying to put on their fig leaf like Adam and Eve did. Right? Whether it's pride or, you know, money or fame, but it's just a fig leaf. You still naked, right? And God sees it all, right? And he says in, in James 3, 13, Who is there among you who is wise and intelligent? Right? Let him by his noble living show forth his good works with the unobtrusive humility of true wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy envy, contention, rivalry, selfish ambition in your hearts. Do not pride yourselves on it, thus being defiance and false to the truth. This wisdom is not as such as come down from above, but it's earthly, animal, even devilish. Right? See, that bitter jealousy, that envy, that's a killer. It's a killer. This is what, why they crucified Jesus. That envy, it's a killer. They couldn't control their minds. They couldn't control their emotions. They were full of envy. See, this is the way people get. This is envy and jealousy. That is a killer. This is a bad, bad demon. It's a bad boy. Let me tell you, it'll eat you up. You know, somebody in the body of Christ moves up in the ranks or gets promoted. You know, God promoted. I'm talking about real promo promotion. I'm not talking about, you know, men's stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. And other people see that and they're like, how come I don't have that? You know what? Because you didn't sow. You, want, you, you see somebody else sow and somebody else reap, and you want to reap, but you won't sow. Right? And so they're jealous. And they're envious. And so what happens? They fight in war. Wherever there's jealousy and envy and contention, there will be confusion, unrest, disharmony, rebellion, and all sorts of evil, vile practices. And we wonder why the body of Christ is like it is. Well, I don't like the way, he, and I don't like you, and I don't like the way he did, and it, and it, and it, and it goes on and on, and round and round it goes. <laughs> right? You're right. You're right. My fig leaf's better than your fig leaf. Right? Well, I saw the wind, and whoo! God, you're still naked. Right? But the wisdom from above is, first of all, pure. It's peace-loving, courteous. 
See, what I'm showing you here is when you see this stuff, I mean, look, this, these scriptures right here, verse uh, 14 through 16, if you see that, those kinds of things happening, uh, don't be naive. This is some evil stuff. When you see these attributes happening in people's lives, don't be naive about it. See it for what it is, right? They need to be set free. They're all bound up. The devil's got them all tied up, right? And they're not free. This is what they hated about Jesus. He was free. He was free, and they weren't free. Those Pharisees were full of jealousy and envy and contention and rivalry and selfish ambition, and the body of Christ is full of this stuff. They are. The body of Christ is immature. No kidding. They are. They're immature. And the pastors don't confront it. They're, they don't confront it. You have to confront it. You have to say the hard things or nobody's going to get out of their little, their little panty waist lives they live. You have to confront it. See, I'm not perfect. I got all kinds of problems, right? But the Word still says it, so we have to say it. This is what we're up against. You see, on the other hand, the wisdom from above is peace-loving and courteous and considerate and gentle, willing to yield to reason, full of compassion and good fruits, wholehearted, straightforward, impartial, unfeigned, right? And when that envy and that jealousy and, and rivalry meets with that, it's friction. It's friction. It don't work together. That's why he says, hey, don't forsake yourselves from the body of Christ because God wants to get that friction going and get that out. See, he's, he doesn't want these people with all this mess to be lost. He wants them to be saved. We're saved by taking his prescription. You know? He doesn't want the body of Christ to be virtual on the internet. It's stupid. I know people who mix mojitos and watch the greatest gospel gunslinger on TV. And they have no conviction. They're not convicted about it at all. And it's all, hey, wow, that was great. Is it, what is that show called? No, I'm just saying. I know people who mix drinks and sit back and oh. watch the, the latest gunslinger, oh. a gospel gunslinger on religious television. You know? God doesn't want a virtual church. He doesn't want a church on Zoom. Everybody's at home in their comfortable homes. That's ridiculous. You know, and the reason they're there is they participate in the plagues of the harlot. Yes. I'm just saying. <laughs> you, you, if there was a sign, ever a sign were in the end times, it's this last plague that happened and everyone's participation in it. Yep. Mm -hmm. A manufactured plague in a laboratory. Oh, we got a vaccine for it. Mm -hmm. You know what I say? I already had it. I don't need a vaccine. I've got the antibodies. That's right. Mm -hmm. What should you be worried? You can't get it from me and I can't get it from you. I am no threat at all. There is no reason for me to take a vaccine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely none. That is proven science for the last 60 years at least. Or more. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And chapter 4, James 4, what leads to strife and feuds and how do conflicts and quarrels and fightings originate among you? Do that not arise from your sensual desires that are ever warring in your bodily members? You are jealous and you covet what others have and your desires go unfulfilled. 
so you become murderers. See, I tell you that jealousy and envy, it is a bad demon. Mm -hmm. It will it'll cause you to be a murderer in your heart. Just saying. To hate is to murder as far as your heart's concerned. You burn with envy and anger and are not able to obtain the gratification, the contentment, the happiness you seek, so you fight in war. You do not have because you do not ask. Right? Jesus said, ask and keep on asking and you shall receive. But see, they don't do that because they don't want to pay the price. They want to reap all the goody. They don't want to pay any price for it. Right? They want to reap, but they don't want to sow. And so they're going to sow something. So they sow to the flesh. And then they're angry because you, you're promoted by the Lord. Or you do ask and yet fail to receive because you ask with wrong, evil purpose and selfish motives. Your intention is when you get what you desire to spend it in sensual pleasures. You're like unfaithful wives having illicit love affairs with the world and breaking your marriage vow to God. You, you don't know that being the world's friend is being God's enemy. So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world takes a stand as an enemy of God. That is a harsh reality. And it needs to be said. We know people. We love these people. They got one foot in the world and one foot in the church. I know a lot of people like that. One foot in the world and one foot in Christianity. All right? And they're a mess. And they're, they're angry uh, at you because you actually maybe do excel. And they get angry at you. And it's their problem. But see, this is the same thing that Jesus was up against. Uh, look at proverb, Proverbs uh, 14. It's the same thing Jesus was up against. I'm telling you these things because you shouldn't be shocked when you're censored and suffer uh, because this is the way things are. It's just the way it is in the world, you know. This, the devil uses people in the body of Christ. I mean, who can work, hurt you the worst but those who are closest to you, right? Right? But it don't have to hurt you if you see it for what it is. And so what I'm saying, we should not be naive. See it for what it is. Right? You don't have to take it personally. You just... You just see it and go, wow, they have a problem, right? If you've checked yourself with the Lord and everything and you know it ain't you, it's them, you'll know it, you know, you'll know it. Prop verbs, not psalms. Okay, y'all have to wait for me. Proverbs 14. Verse 14, Proverbs 14, verse 30. A calm and undisturbed mind and heart are the life and health of the body. Right? I mean, don't we like that? But he who is hasty of spirit, no, but envy, jealousy, and wrath are like rottenness to the bones. Right? You see these people, and they're always all wrought up and pointing fingers and, you know, dissatisfied, and, and they wonder why they're sick all the time. You know, they wonder why they have all this stuff going on. Hey, we all got stuff going on, and we're trying to walk the crucified walk. Yeah. Right? So that doesn't just prove, you know, just because you have that. Well, you have rottenness in the bones. What it does prove is that Satan takes advantage of everything. 
He just does. That's what it proves. You can be walking the best walk you can walk and you're still battling because Satan's going to try to convince you that it don't work. That's what he's going to do. I mean, it's what he does to me all the time. He tells me all the time, you're going to die. Mm-hmm. Or you got this, and oh, that's probably that. Right? And you're going to die. Right? Mm-hmm. And you have to rule your mind. You have to work your way through the process. See, everybody's going through the same thing. We're all going through it. Oh, you, you feel that? You feel that? You got cancer. You got cancer. You know? And you're going to die. Right? And, and what do we do? We just go, well, okay. Well, the Word says, and the Word says, and the Word yeah. says. Right? And that's what we do. I, I remember, I think God was tired of me being worried about it. And I remember one time, He just drew me up short and He said, Hey! I'll tell you when you're get, if you're going to die or not. Don't listen to him. I mean, he just had enough of my belly aching, and actually it set me free. And I just went, oh, well, thank you, Lord. I think if you're going to tell me when, then I'm in good hands. Right? I mean, it just set me free. That was a long, long time ago. But I was scared. I was scared all the time. And he just, man, he just nailed me. That's the best nailing I ever had, right? I was like, oh, oh, thank you, Jesus. It's up to you. It's not up to him, right? Right? And you know what? He's telling me, I don't want you to die. It's not my will for you to die. That's right. Right? So I'm going, well, okay then. I I can can deal with it. Hey, this is helping me right now. I'm telling you. (laughs) All right, go to Psalm 128. (laughs) Oh, man. All right, I'm doing this in the Amplified Bible. So it's in the brackets. Okay, Psalm 128. Blessed. Happy, fortunate, to be envied. You hear that? If you're blessed, you're going to be envied. You see that? Yeah. God blesses you, you're going to be envied. See? Is everyone who fears, reveres, and worships the Lord, who walks in His ways and lives according to His commandments, Man, you're blessed and you're envied. You see that? Because that's flesh. If you're blessed, somebody's going to envy it. It was because of envy that they crucified Jesus. Right? It is no different for you. If you get blessed, somebody's going to envy it. Well, I want to be blessed like that. Right? But they don't want to... They don't want to pay any price for that. See? They sow something else and they expect, well, then I should reap what... No, that's not how it works. Whatsoever you sow, that's what you reap. You don't, you don't sow entertainment all the time and then reach, reap spiritual maturity 10 years down the road. That's not how it works. Right? Is that, is that clear? Matthew. Just so we get it in in the New Testament. Let's get it in the Greek. Five. Matthew 5. Sorry. Matthew 5. You know, the Beatitudes. Right? Verse 3. Blessed to be envied and spiritually prosperous with life joy and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation. Right? Are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I'm just saying, uh, you know, Mark 15, 10, it was because of envy. 
Pilate knew. It was because of envy. They crucified Jesus. He knew it. Acts chapter 7. Oh, oh, oh. And what am I saying here? You know, he's saying in, in Luke 21, you know, we went over it last week. Because you, you bear his name and for his sake, you be hated by everybody. See? Because you're envied. See? See, when you win the true life of your soul, that's true blessing. Right? And it will show. And people will go, I want that. And the right attitude would be, hey, I need to repent and do the works that that uh, God requires so I can get that. That would be the right reaction to that. Right? Remember the, those places in Acts when, when the, the Pharisees were convicted and cut to the heart. Right? And what must we do? What must we do, you know, to get right with God? You know, whatever it says. It. In another place it says they were cut to the heart and they went after them. Urgh, they wanted to kill them. Two different hearts, yeah. see? Two different yeah. reactions, yeah. right? Look at Matthew 7, I mean right. Acts, Acts 7, sorry. <laughs> Verse 8, how do you get Matthew out of Acts? Do not know. <laughs> Acts 7, 8, And God made with Abraham a covenant of which circumcision was a seal, and under these circumstances Abraham became the father of Isaac, circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac then became the father of Jacob. Jacob was born uh, the twelve patriarchs. Right? What a mess. Right? See, God can handle it. Right? He's not shocked. Like, yeah, I know the end from the beginning. I know how you're made. Right? And still, he's calling mankind. He knows our frame. And still he calls us. Because with him, it's possible. It's just that we got to get in him. And the patriarchs, boiling with envy and hatred and anger, sold Joseph into slavery in Egypt. But God was with him. Hey, God used Joseph, right? He used him, and they didn't like it, right? They should have loved it, and in, in the end, they did because he collected all the food and saved them from the famine. He delivered him from all his distress and afflictions and won him goodwill and favor and wisdom and understanding in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him governor over Egypt and all his house. I mean, hey, you walk with God, he'll even, he'll, he'll, you will rule in the midst of your foes. I mean, look at the life of Daniel. Wow, what a life, man. Every, every, I mean, he went through ruler after ruler, right? And every place he went, he got promoted to the top. In enemy territory. Well, you're in enemy territory, right? So, you know, this is what God wants. This is what he wants. This is his will. He's no respecter of persons. Look at Acts 13. But the, see, that's flesh. That's, that's just the way flesh is. You see somebody get something that they don't get. You know. Brr, you know. They're jealous. It's a real killer, man. And it turns around on them and it gets them. Acts 13, 38. So, let it be clearly known and understood by you, brethren, that through this man, Jesus, forgiveness and removal of sins is now proclaimed to you and that through him everyone who believes is absolved uh, from uh, every charge from which he could not be justified and free by the law of Moses and given right standing with God. Take care, therefore, lest there come upon you what was spoken in the prophets. Look, you scoffers and scorners. That's what the prophets said. 
and marvel and perish and vanish away. Hey, let me say something about prophets. <coughs> prophets are not perfect. They're saying what God tells them to say. See, a true prophet, he's just telling you what God's saying to say. He, it's not, he's not perfect, right? It's not even his idea. He's just telling you what God says. That's what a prophet is, all right? And, and they would murder them because they didn't like what they said, right? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, murdering the prophets, right? Stoning those who are sent to you. Wow. The same things in the body of Christ to the day, today, right? Everybody must get stoned, right? <laughs> Bob Dylan. <laughs> Same thing today. Murdering the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you. <coughs> well, my denomination doesn't believe that. I understand, but what does the word say? But my denomination says, yeah. it doesn't matter. What does the word say? Right? All right, take care lest there come upon you. Yeah. Uh, look, you scoffers and scorners, marvel and vanish away, for I'm doing a deed in your days, a deed in which you will never have confidence or believe in if someone clearly, clearly declares it to you. And Paul and Barnabas went out of the synagogue. Uh, the people earnestly begged that these things might be told them further the next Sabbath. And I don't know why they're waiting to the next Sabbath. I'd want to know the next minute. But anyway, when the congregation, the synagogue dispersed, many of the Jews and devout converts in Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas who talked to them and urged them, you see, there they go, and urged them to continue in the grace of God. And the next time, almost the entire city gathered together to hear the word of God. And when the Jews, see, that's going to happen again, but it's going to be in the midst of judgment. You're going to see an entire city gather. Help us! What do we got to do? Because they know they're fixing to all die. Because that's what's coming to planet Earth. Yep. Well, I don't believe that. I've been saying that forever. It doesn't matter. We're closer than ever. That's right. Right? Almost the entire city gathered together, but when the Jews saw the crowds filled with envy and jealousy, they contradicted what was said by Paul and talked abusively, reviling and slandering them. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out plainly and boldly, saying, it was necessary for God's message should be spoken to you first, but since you thrust it from you, you pass this judgment on yourselves that you are unworthy of eternal life, and out of your own mouth you will be judged. Now, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. And so the Lord charged us, saying, I have set you to a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the othermost parts of the earth. Right? Wow. See, that was a big deal. See, we look at it now, uh, it's a big deal. No, it was a big deal. That was bold. Right? Because... Here's men walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And the Jews hated them for it. They were jealous, right? No, you got to do it our way. All right, uh, go to Galatians 5. We're just about through. You know, in Galatians 5, he's telling you about the fruit of the Spirit, you know, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness. Hey, you, you get around people walking in the Spirit, this is what you get. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Me and Tom work out at Rushing Wind and we have our chores. Man, we, we, this is the way we are towards each other. It, right? Yes, sir. It's good time. Right? Good time in the Lord. Hard work, it's good time. It doesn't matter. You know, it's good for our body. And Tammy usually feeds us real good. <laughs> Ain't that right? Yeah, she does. We eat some good meals out there. 
gentleness, self-control. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. Verse 24, with its passions and appetites and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Right? Let us not become vainglorious and self-conceited and competitive and challenging and provoking and irritating to one another, envying and being jealous of one another. See, he's saying in this in the context, hey, you walking in the Spirit, you got all the goody here, right? And in the same little verses in context, he's saying, hey, but don't become envious and jealousy. Why is he saying that? Because Satan don't like the fruit of the Spirit and this other stuff is antagonistic to it. And we are subject to this. You know, in the verses in the next thing, you know, well, we'll read it in 6 verse 1. If any person is overtaken in misconduct or sin of any sort, you who are spiritual, right, should set him right. Well, setting somebody right doesn't mean you just tolerate it. I mean, hey, have a talk with them. And say, hey, man, this stuff, this ain't cutting it. Right? It's, it's going crossways with the Holy Spirit. He says, uh, without any sense of superiority, you know, reinstate him with all gentleness, keep an attentive eye on yourself, lest you should be tempted also. So that just tells you all this stuff is from the devil. Lest you be tempted also. See, jealousy, envy, rivalry, competition, all this stuff here, that, this is of the devil. Right? And he gets people, he baits them into it, you know. And you know what? It feels good in the flesh, but it's wrong. And then what's really bad is you become self-righteous about it. You're right, everybody else is wrong, right? And, and you're in a heap of trouble. You're in a heap of trouble. You're not free. You, you, you've lost your peace. You've lost your joy. You've lost your faith in the Lord. Right? This is what this stuff will do. It's a killer. It's a killer. But see, God wants us to go, hey, we understand. You know, you fell for it. You know, you got into the habit of it. You messed up. And we'd like to reinstate you. We'd like to help you out. But see, then it's up to them. All right? I mean, you can't make somebody, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, right? So we should, we should understand what's happening here. This isn't just that person. Yeah, they're involved because they gave themselves over to the tempter. And he got, a, he got a leg up on them, right? So Father, help us. Help us be what you want us to be in the body of Christ. That, that while we're sanding all these rough edges off of each other, that, that we'll see it for what it is, Father. And, and that, that we will have the true wisdom, the humility to see things the way they are and not live in some illusion. That, that just because we love people, it doesn't mean we have to tolerate everything but that we will be loving towards everyone and we will try to reinstate and restore all those who have fallen away from us. And Father, just help us by your grace and give us wisdom and understanding and insight into these things. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name.